so much for this recognition. I am humbled to be in the company of the previous recipients, all of whom I know professionally and many of whom I know personally. And uh, you've given me this honor and I'd really like to return the favor. I'd like to acknowledge the UAB Department of Biostatistics and the School of Public Health. You established this award to recognize Dr. Norwood's achievements and I love the introduction by David about her. You recognized her achievements and the contributions of all women to the statistical sciences. The 16 years of this award has brought attention to women statisticians everywhere, highlighting their efforts and encouraging women students in statistics as well as early career statisticians. As a woman who 30 years ago was the only woman in her graduate school class at Stanford, thank you, thank you from all of us. This encouragement and validation of our efforts cannot be underestimated. This award has made a difference. You have made a difference here at UAB. Diversity of people and ideas makes science strong, and your award has contributed to increasing diversity in the statistical sciences. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank the department and the staff. Kay, thank you for organizing a visit for me here yesterday. I've had a wonderful time learning about your past, your present, and hearing about your exciting future under your new chair. Thank you so much for welcoming me. I am now your ambassador, and I hope to add to your visibility. I will go out and talk about this department, and we've already talked about a few collaborations that we might be able to do, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. So as you heard, Janet Norwood was the American Statistical Association president in 1989. And exactly 20 years later, I was the president of the ASA. And when I worked on my presidential address, I read hers carefully because we shared a similar topic, which is statistics in the service of public policy. And on this slide, you see the slide that I actually had in my talk in blue there. I quoted her in my ASA presidential address. She visited the Committee on National Statistics, which is the standing National Academies of Sciences Committee that talks about federal statistics issues, and I was a member, and she came and spoke to us, and I was too scared to talk to her. <laughs> I just sat there and viewed her. She was one of my heroes in statistics. She had incredible clarity of thought, um, but I didn't talk to her. In 2009, when I was ASA president, I was invited to go to the swearing-in of the census director, and there's a picture of him there, Bob Groves being sworn in as census director. So I received this invitation. I was at RTI in North Carolina at that time, and I thought, oh, I won't go. And then I thought, no, what, what, what an event I should go. So I bought a ticket uh, from Raleigh to Washington, a plane ticket, and I got on the 6 a.m. out of Raleigh, and I landed about 7 a.m. in National Airport, Reagan Airport, and I went to the Metro because the Census Bureau is in Suitland, which is quite far out on the Metro. And I got on the Metro car, and who is sitting there? Janet Norwood. <laughs> so I thought to myself, you need to have courage, Sally. And I went and I sat next to her. And I talked to her for about the hour-long trip uh, to Suitland. And we talked about the census and statistics, and it was that piece of statistical history that I was able to touch. I did not see her again. She died in 2015. But uh, to, to be here now and receive this award in honor of her, I'm just, I'm just very humbled. And I would say to all the students, have that courage. If you're at a conference and you really admire someone, just walk up to them afterwards after their talk, invite them for coffee, and, and touch that piece of statistical history for yourself. So on this slide are some quotes from Janet Norwood's ASA presidential address. In 1983, there was a profile of her in the Washington Post magazine, and I'll quote, objective, objective methodologic, meth methodical, unflappable, under sometimes hostile congressional questioning, Norwood measures our prosperity and tells the man on the street whether the next line he stands in is likely to be at the bank teller window or the unemployment office. And as you heard from David, she went up to Capitol Hill 137 times, and she had a reputation 
for delivering nothing but objective, unspun facts in sessions that she compared to as fencing matches. <laughs> so this is her presidential address. I was also motivated in 2009 by a quote by P Peter Orzag as I prepared my speech. He said, policy decisions should be driven by evidence. Peter Orzag was the director of the Office of Management of Budget under Obama. And you can really hear echoes of Norwood in this statement. So as we think about statisticians and how we participate in policy, which has been my career for 30 years, how do we think about that? This is a recent editorial in Science Magazine by Chris Coons, who's a US senator. Look at that quote. Don't just publish your research, publicize it. Scientists simply can't be silent or else science truly will be silenced. He's thrown down the gauntlet to us, not to serve as advocates for a particular position, but to serve as honest brokers. Many scientists do their science, and they say, here it is, and they walk away. I think what Coons and Norwood and Orzag are saying to us is it is our responsibility to explain that science. We need to have the skills to do that, and we need to have the courage to do that. I think there's a great cost to society if we don't participate in the conversation about science. So let me turn now to what's been on every statistician's mind in the last five to 10 years. What is it? Big data. So I'm a bit of a big data skeptic. I heard last night at dinner that our dean is a bit of an evidence-based medicine skeptic. I'm a bit of a big data skeptic. I don't think that size overwhelms design. But big data is here, and it's an opportunity for us as statisticians. So in the last couple of years, I've been thinking about how should statisticians respond to big data. And I coined a term, which is really not taken off. But I decided to try it again today. I've decided in response to big data, we should do big statistics, OK? So what are big statistics? So as I think about this, I think about getting involved early in the process. Don't wait to the end, the analysis phase. Those who control the data control the world, so make sure you're there at the beginning. Collaborate with scientists, with policymakers. This is what Janet Noor was so good at. You heard about her traveling around to speak uh, to governors and so on. Acknowledge the politics. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of projects that I've worked on, and you'll see the politics came in. And I think really be a leader. So the students here are sitting, and they're saying, Wait, I went to graduate school to be a statistician. Not a leader, not all this stuff about communicating to be a statistician. So let me just show you an example. If you haven't seen this example from the New England Journal in 2012, if you teach linear regression, it's a very good example to use. The New England Journal is usually a very serious journal, but now and then it has more humorous articles. So what this article did is it related the per capita consumption of chocolate to the number of Nobel laureates per 100,000 uh, population. So what you see is a very strong positive relationship. This has an R squared of about 0.8. Okay, the, the countries, as you can see, are represented by their flags. So I was very relieved to read this article because I really like chocolate. Finally, I thought, <laughs> I thought an excuse. Now, there is an outlying country. Do you see where it is? It's Sweden, right? It's right up in the middle there. It appears that in Sweden, you don't have to eat that much chocolate to get the same bang for the buck in terms of Nobel laureates. That's the biological explanation for that outlier. Now, what's the cynical view? The Nobel laureate committee has more Swedes on it. They vote for their countrymen and countrywomen. That's the cynical view. What's the problem with these data? And you know this because you're statisticians, a lot of you. Correlation is not causation. There's also an issue of ecological regression here because you've taken an average over each country, but that, we could talk about that in more detail at another time. If you're an early career student or here as a statistician, the world needs this ex explained. We need to do big statistics. We need to be part of this conversation. We need statisticians at the table. My table is a policy table. 
Yours might be something else. It might be genetics conversation, cancer, whatever your issue is, but you need to be at the table. So now you're saying to me, well, right, you're talking about being a leader, you're a dean, you wear the dean's tiara. Dean Michael has a crown. Um, so we have leadership by position, right? We have a title, we have responsibility, we have authority, we may have some resources now and then uh, to make decisions, and we're given that leadership through that title. There's also assumed leadership, which many statisticians find themselves in that position. You're on a project, you're the only methodolog methodologist, you need to step up and be a leader in that conversation. That's actually harder than being a leader by position because that's leader by influence. That requires communication, collaboration. But I think every statistician, you have an opportunity to be a leader. Don't be left out of that conversation. Step up and take that opportunity. I want to return just back to big data because it's always bothered me, that term big data and it's focused on size and veracity and velocity and we've heard all those words. I actually like the term all data. If you haven't heard of this term, this to me is preferable. This is a quote from... It's the first of the month. Don't okay, it's, it's not my microphone. microphone. Okay, I was worried I was getting feedback from my... Thank you, thank you, David. So by all data, we, we think about not just size of data, but different levels. So I work in in health and health policy, we're thinking about genetics data, very fine data, very deep. We think about administrative data, maybe administrative records for patients, more coarse but across a bigger population. We think about geographical data. I've worked on projects where we look at the location of supermarkets to try to understand whether people have access to fresh foods and so on. This is the challenge for statisticians. It's the synthesis across different levels of data, different fineness and coarseness. How do we put all data together? So when I, I actually talk about the big data revolution, I prefer this term because I think it really encompasses what the challenges and the opportunities for are, are for us as statisticians. So I'm now gonna change a little bit in the talk. I'm gonna look at a couple of examples in my career and tell you about what I learned as I try to do big statistics and carry forward Janet Norwood's legacy. So the first project I'm gonna talk about was in the, in the 2000s. I was a member of the Evidence-Based Practice Center at RAND, which does systematic reviews and meta-analysis for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, HRQ. At that time, there was a lot of focus on herbal supplements. And one of the focuses was on ephedra. Ephedra is a plant. The active ingredient in it is ephedrine alkaloids. And if you're hearing pseudoephedrine in that word, these are related, and amphetamines as well are related. There was a death of a young man, a Baltimore Orioles pitcher named Steve Belcher, and ephedra was implicated in his death. Ephedra in this country is taken to improve athletic performance and also to help lose weight. In other countries, China, Germany, and elsewhere, it's used for different conditions and symptoms. Public Citizen asked the Health and Human Services Secretary to ban ephedra, and we were asked to do a systematic review on both the efficacy, how well it works to enhance athletic performance or lose weight, as well as the safety of ephedra. For this talk, I'm just going to focus on the safety of ephedra. So what did we do? We looked at several types of data, all data again. We looked at clinical trials and looked at adverse events, serious adverse events, death, heart attack, stroke, these kind of things, out of the clinical trials, which as you know, good internal validity, but limited generalizability. And these were small clinical trials, 30 people did they lose weight, 15 in, both, in either group, a control and a FEDRA. So we also had to look at observational data. We looked at case reports, the FDA MedWatch data set. This at the time was a telephone uh, collection. If you took a FEDRA and you thought you'd had a heart attack, you could pick up the phone, call the FDA, and report the event. So very much observational and motivated out there, a, a physician could pick up the phone as well. Uh, your spouse 
could say, uh, my spouse has had a heart attack and took ephedra, and you could report events like that. There was also an ephedra producer called Metabolife that was producing herbal supplements, and they actually collected adverse event data as well for their products. They were subpoenaed, and we got their data set, and I'm gonna show you some examples in a moment. So let's imagine you're in the following situation. You open the newspaper and you see this article. This is another baseball pitcher, a young man who died in 2002. And you're looking at this article, and there were implications in this article that it was Fedra that had killed him as well. And you're trying to understand, did he die from a Fedra? So how would you go about doing that? Well, what we did is we looked at each event and there were about 20,000 events that were reported by the time you took Metabolife, the FDA MedWatch data, the clinical trials, and the case reports. We looked at each event and we tried to classify it as what we called a sentinel event or a possibly sentinel event. In a sentinel event, we looked to see, did the event occur? So a death has been reported. Was there a death record? Okay. Did this actually happen? If I say I had a heart attack, did I really have a heart attack or just heart palpitations? Was there a medical record that actually defined it as a heart attack? We looked to see that there was documentation the person had taken ephedra within the last 24 hours. You can do that with an autopsy and look in the blood. If the person died, did they have ephedra in their bloodstream? We also looked for, and here's the difficult point, whether there was documentation of anything else that could have caused the death. So is this what is called an idiopathic event? Nothing else except ephedra seems to have caused this event. And I'll show you an example in a moment. A possibly sentinel event is you know the person took ephedra, the event occurred, but other things might have caused the event. Let me show you some examples. This is actually language from an event that was classified as a sentinel event. The first thing to notice is that this young woman was very young. 22 years old. These people were young that these events were occurring to. She had taken ephedra, and you'll notice they've, they ruled out other causes of death. So this was classified as a sentinel death, uh, and this person took ephedra. Here's an example of a possibly sentinel event. So again, young man, 38, he's out jogging, he has a cup of coffee. This was very interesting. A lot of people were taking both caffeine and ephedra at the same time. Think of ephedra, it works like an amphetamine as well. It, it, so it's not surprising. There's biological plausibility as to why people would have racing hearts, heart attacks, and so on. He took ripped fuel, which was a known ephedra supplement. But at autopsy, he was found to have triple vessel coronary artery disease. So this is possibly sentinel because there's another reason, his triple vessel disease, that might have caused his death. Let me show you an event that was classified as uncertain. This is a metabolife case report. You can't read it. Right, this is what they look like. So in metabolife, they would have a person at the phone and you would call up and they would basically scribble on a piece of paper. We had 18,000 of these in PDF form. What did we do? We had an army of six very dedicated nurses who double coded each of these events, okay? This is insufficient information. You can't really read it. You can read a little bit. Husband took met seizures. Do you see the word seizures? It's right here, seizures. But you have no way of now determining, did they really take ephedra and did seizures actually occur? So this is insufficient information. The metabolife events were very difficult to classify. Let me show you a table of the final classification. So these are all the serious events. Remember we had 20,000 and there's only all these number of events that actually could be classified and were stated as serious avertus events. So you notice there were 84 deaths reported across these more than 20,000 reports. 80% of them had insufficient information to classify. Five of them were sentinel events. I've circled that number, five. That number is the number that banned ephedra in the United States. 
five. This is an interesting number. So five, these are young lives, these are people, it's tragic as individuals. But there's no measure of rate here. I gave this talk once and somebody yelled in the back, what about smoking? Okay, right? <laughs> I mean, smoking kills a lot more people than five. But this is really the number. And all of the pressure, this is the politics trying to do big statistics, okay? This is the politics that was happening. There was such focus on herbal supplements. But it's that number five, and there were 12 sentinel events. So what were the conclusions of our report, and what happened? It's important to know that herbal supplements do not undergo the same scrutiny as drugs. They adhere to a different law that was established in 1994 called the DEISHA law, they are assumed to be safe, but they're not required to be proven safe. So if I'm putting an herbal supplement on the market, I don't come under the same law as if I'm putting a drug on the market. The sci and, and it goes both ways. The scientific standard to overturn this assumption of safety is just to demonstrate that there is a significant or unreasonable risk. So, you could look at that five and you could try to do a significance test and we had other data where we had an odds ratio and it was not statistically significant. But that's not the standard of evidence that's used by Health and Human Services to overturn the sale of these herbal supplements. So as a statistician, you need to understand what are the standards of evidence that are being used in the milieu that you're working with. Okay, so what happened? What happened is the FDA published what's called a final rule prohibiting the sale of dietary supplements containing ephedrine alkaloids. They did not ban the sale of dietary supplements that contain ephedra, only the active ingredient ephedrine alkaloids. That's important to know. So you can you'd still buy in this country, you can walk in and buy an herbal supplement that contains ephedra. You can also go on the web and buy an herbal supplement that contains ephedrine alkaloids in Canada and have it shipped to you here in the United States. Okay. So what did I learn? Well, the first thing is that second picture, Kyle, they actually did an autopsy and he had 80 to 90% narrowing of the arteries. So he would have been a possible sentinel event in our analysis had he been part of our data set. So what did I learn? I was the early well, the mid part of my career at RAND, this was a storm. We were served at RAND. I was served because we were sued by makers of herbal supplements that contained ephedra because this was a real blow to them. They can no longer sell, sell their supplement. And once this came out, then people who had had the adverse events or their families were threatening to sue. So I was actually served at RAND. Uh, we didn't actually get sued in the end. They went away, but that, that was fairly frightening. There's no other word for it. One thing they really did well at RAND uh, that I was very grateful for is as we wrote our report, we thought really hard about how it might be interpreted. So we sat there and we said, how would the herbal supplement body look at this report? How would Health and Human Services? We tried to anticipate the spin and think about how it would be communicated. So I'll give you an example. The herbal supplement lobby said, well, look, it's safe. There were no deaths in the clinical trials, and the clinical trials are the strongest evidence. Okay, there were no deaths in the clinical trials. There were only about 500 patients in total in both the control and treatment groups in the clinical trials. You'd have to have an incredibly high death rate to see even one death in the clinical trials. And the clinical trials were short, they were usually six weeks in duration, so the people aren't really taking the drug for a long time, but there were no deaths. That's what the herbal supplement lobby focused on. Health and Human Services focused on that number five that I showed you before. I had to talk to a lot of journalists during this time. I got a lot of phone calls, and one thing I learned as a statistician, I was always taught, okay, I'll you know, chronologically march through the analysis. It doesn't work. We're, we're told not to give the anecdote, the end of one, but I found actually explaining the Kyle 
using that Kyle example initially as a story with the journalist and then moving back to the methods was a good way to communicate with the journalists. Um, I had an early experience in my career where I served on this national committee that was looking at how um, Title IX funds are given out uh, to school districts, which is a very political issue. And uh, we did all this modeling and this uh, staffer for the senator from California called me up and she said, explain the report to me. And I launched into this 20 minute monologue about shrinkage estimates and <laughs> I thought I was just being so clear. And at the end I paused to take a breath and she said, what's a model? <laughs> and a boy, misjudge of the audience. So I learned, you know, you really need to think about, put yourself in that person's seat. What do they understand? What do they want to know? Because that staffer only wanted to know, was California going to lose money? She didn't care about the report. She didn't care. So it was my job to give her that information, but also try to place it in the context of the analysis. So this was an interesting, I was proud of this analysis. It was very strong. I often tell students, make your analysis strong so if someone shakes it, it stands firm. You know, look at it from every direction. So now I'm going to change gears slightly and talk about some more recent work that I've been involved in. And I know we have some experts in the audience here on this. I've been doing a lot of work with PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute that was established in healthcare reform. It looks at comparative effectiveness research and also patient-centered outcomes research. And PCORI has really tried to do research differently. And my friend has this car analogy. So she says, it used to be we were the researcher, we were driving the car and the patient sat in the back. And we said, we are going to New York. We would drive to New York. We would set the outcomes, we would set the design, we would set the whole study. Now in patient-centered outcomes research, the patient is actually sitting in the front seat with us. And we say, we are going to New York. And they say, no, I want to go to Birmingham. And what I mean by that is they help us choose the outcomes, the focus of the study. And it's, it's very interesting. They are not subjects of the research. They are not participants. They are now partners in the research. In the PCORI legislation, the PCORI methodology committee was established. You can actually read the five pages of the 973 of Obamacare legislation. There's five pages devoted to PCORI. And the PCORI methodology committee was established. And it was legislated, it says right there, that the methodology committee must set standards for the conduct of comparative effectiveness research. Methodological standards, rules, if you will. I was very bothered by this initially. I thought, what, me, the statistical police, no. And then I thought, what, I would have to adhere to the standards? I know what I'm doing, you know. It just didn't seem right. But I'm a very practical person. I thought to myself, it's legislated, we have to do this. And then I realized that these standards are actually an avenue of voice piece for us as a community to help improve research in comparative effectiveness. So it's a really, it's, a, it's an opportune time for the profession to bring the standards up. So I worked on a project that's kind of related to PCORI. I thought to myself, Let's look at the standards for observational studies. Now, many of us do randomized controlled trials here, so we know the concert statement, right, for randomized controlled trials. If you published in JAMA, for example, you've got to adhere to the concert statement. I do a lot of meta-analysis. It's the quorum statement. So think to yourself, there are similar statements, sets of guidelines for observational studies. So we did a systematic review to search for international guidelines or statements about standards for observational studies. We conducted this systematic review, as it says here, and we developed an evidence table. This is a little small, but think to yourself, this huge Excel spreadsheet. The columns are the nine international standards. There's the GRACE checklist. There were the PCORI standards. You see them there, the third column. And we went into each of the standards and guidelines, and we tried to pull out uh, the standards that pertain to certain steps in observational studies. So one of the first steps is you review the prior research. 
right? You look at the past research. And most standards say you should do that before conducting an observational study. So just think to yourself, we went through every one of those standards and we pulled out the relevant bit for that step in an observational study. And here's an example. This is the PCORI standard that pertains to prior research. It says identify gaps in evidence and then it gives more uh, uh, a verbiage about how to do that. Now as you think about this break Excel spreadsheet, some of the cells will be filled in and others won't. PCORI may not address certain steps in an observational study. So we have this huge Excel spreadsheet. So I had the brilliant idea that we would put it on poster paper. And we did that. And we stuck it up on the wall in my office, imagine. And then we tried to make sense of it. Do the standards agree or disagree? And we came up with the following table. This is a stoplight table, as it's called. But there's a color here that you usually don't see in stoplight tables. What is it? Blue. OK. So let me explain the colors. First of all, you see the steps. There's review of prior research. Uh, think about bias is here, dissemination, interpretation. These are all steps in observational studies. Where you see a green, and there's two green boxes, seven to nine of the guidelines address this step in observational studies, and they agreed on what to do. That's green. Blue is seven to nine addressed it, but the standards disagreed. Yellow is four to six of the standards addressed it, and red is only one to three addressed it. So for example here, ethical considerations, only one to three of the standards addressed it. When I saw this table, I went, whoa, <laughs> okay? So there's a couple things that could explain the differences in this table. First of all, these standards are very different in format. The GRACE checklist literally has, did you do this or that, yes or no? Did you do this, yes or no? The PCORI standards are very verbiage heavy, as you saw on the last slide. They're for different audiences. We have the ISPOR standards for pharmacoepi studies. Those are really different than the PCORI. I see my economist nodding his head. Those are very different than the PCORI, so these might be different audiences. But there's something about this that should worry us a little bit. Because you might imagine that the choice of standard that you use could actually impact the results of your study. So imagine that I did a study and I followed the PCORI methodology standards and Charity did the same study, but she followed ISPOR. Would we reach a different conclusion? Saying that even further, would the impact we have on patient care actually be different? And that's, that's fairly problematic to think about. And I think it's because observational studies are so hard to sort of figure out and do. There are many standards in meta-analysis to look at the quality of RCTs. And the reason that's a lot easier than looking at the quality of observational studies. First of all, when I say observational studies, what do I mean? Do I mean prospective cohort or case control? Or, I mean, observational studies is a very wide set of designs. And we might even disagree on how to name those designs, right? People disagree on the language. But we really are asking these questions now in the research that we're doing now. First of all, do we need a common core set of standards? I don't know, that could be a question. Number two, should we say these standards are best practice or should they be a minimum bar? How do we enforce the standards? Is that even a good idea? At PCORI, you must demonstrate that you, in your analysis plan, you are going to follow the methodological standards that are relevant for your study. You won't be funded unless you demonstrate that. So that's kind of a, a stick, if you will. Uh, some journals. You must follow the consort statement if you want to publish an RCT. You must follow the quorum statement if you want to publish a meta-analysis. So they're using a stick, right, rather than maybe a carrot. Maybe funding is the carrot that PCORI has. If you wanted to harmonize these standards, how do you do that? Who pays for it? Who leads it? How do you practically do that? Um, how do you update the standards? So, 
Uh, when we as statisticians think about standards, so there's going to be standard for missing data, which is charity's area, do we say then that no more research is necessary in missing data? I mean, ha a lot of people are worried that standards will stifle innovation in the methodological space. But we're thinking about this now, and for me, again, as a statistician who works in policy, this is a tool by which to improve research in the policy agenda. So I'm going to close here. As I thought about this talk, I really tried to think about Janet Norwood's legacy. I decided she really did big statistics, right? So she was interviewed in the New York Times, and, she, and I'll quote her. She said, you can't have a democratic society without having a good database. And she said, I find it a stimulating challenge to go 137 times up to Congress. There are always a variety of innovative senators and representatives. I like that word, innovative senators and representatives. I can only imagine that was a politically chosen word. Who raise questions that I have to be very careful to answer in a completely objective framework. She did big statistics, and I hope all of us aspire in whatever setting we're in to do big statistics as well. So I just want to close this talk um, by recalling a Newton quote, which you all know. If I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. None of us travels alone. I've had the great good fortune uh, to have the generosity of teachers and mentors and colleagues and friends over the course of 30 years. And I stand here too because of your leadership the leadership of the Department of Biostatistics and the UAB School of Public Health in establishing this award and bringing visibility to women statistical scientists and to statistics in general. Thank you. And I also stand here because of a supportive family, a loving husband. I have three children and three grandchildren. And when I accept this award, I accept it on their behalf as well. And I stand here because of you so thank you very much.